I think it would be accurate to say that we as a community have turned our backs on the modern world. We would broadly be defined, therefore, as a group of reactionaries, first and foremost. Uh, the main problem that faces us, however, in that regard, is the fact that all the people in this room have been brought here by significantly different currents of thought. I will explain quite what I mean by this later on, but in my opinion, our overarching weakness is a lack of any unified metaphysical whole capable of self-defense. In simpler terms, we either believe in different functional principles, or we have no functional principles. No amount of theory or thinking will overcome this problem. No matter how powerful our intellectual prowess is, we amount to nothing without those unified metaphysical goals. Now, before I go any further, I will stress, I'm not asking for blanket uniformity. Within the realm of authentic reaction, there is room for enormous nuances of thought and conviction. To use that word, there is room for diversity. We will, in Napoleonic terms, have our ministry of all the talents. I'm asking that what we go forward with is an orthodoxy for a truly anti-modern creed to construct a corpus of reactionary minds worthy of that name which at present I do not think we have. The man who adopts this creed, I term the authentic reactionary. This accurately distinguishes him from the corruptors of the word reactionary. First, the leftists, who use it to slam their opponents as a capital term for those who disagree with their progressive madness. And the so-called neo-reactionaries, who I term the Yarganites, after their uh, rather greasy-haired program founder, um, who adopted it, I think, as bait to trap otherwise powerful minds in a system of fallacies, sophistry, and meaningless jargon. Now, the very existence of the authentic reactionary is a colossal scandal to the progressive. The presence of such a man is the greatest proof that the progressive's assurances about the innate good of his system are in fact wrong. It is the authentic reactionary who is able to suffer the shipwreck of the modern world with dignity even though the other passengers drowning in the sea hate him for it. Now, to lay out what exactly the authentic reactionary as a position is could take up a number of heavy volumes. So rather than simply list things we should believe in or reject, I've organised this speech as a concentric argument, as opposed to a linear one, because at its heart, the position of the authentic reactionary is a concentration of interlocking values. It's a distillation of the tenets of a healthy society, those that existed in abundance before the calamity of 1789. I believe the uh, date of the beginning of the real death of Europe. The authentic reactionary is an individual whose main intellectual activity is to plumb the depths and the heights of history, to find the immortal values of great ages and people past. There is no resurrection of past societies or people or empires or movements. There is only the maintenance of values. Nicholas Gomez Dowler, the patron saint of modern reactionaries and the man to whom this concept owes his name, said that to be reactionary is not to espouse settled cases, nor to plead for determined conclusions, but rather to submit our will to the necessity that does not constrain, to surrender our freedom to the exigency that does not compel. It is to find sleeping certainties that guide us to the edge of ancient pools. The reactionary is not a nostalgic dreamer of a cancelled past, but rather a hunter of sacred shades upon the eternal hills. I uh, urge everybody to read Nicholas Gomez Davila, although there is a slight issue with that because all his works are so far in Spanish, German, and Polish. Uh, but uh, if you do have any Spanish speakers in the room, then uh, please get, uh, contact me and uh, I think it would be great help with the translation project. Now, the next point that I will make is that to be a reactionary, to be fundamentally opposed to modernity, is to understand that man is a problem without a human solution. Every human society that has ever existed shares the same fundamental flaws because every human society is obviously made up of humans. It doesn't matter if we're in ancient Greece or modern America or Soviet Russia or the imagined Pakistan or even Little Trumpton. Uh, the same crimes, the same sins, the same quirks, the same miracles will be witnessed. The only thing that changes is the scale how we react to them, and the aesthetics of them. Now, politics as a feature of human society is still a vital field of study for us, but to be a reactionary is to understand that politics is not the art of devising solutions to problems. 
solutionism, as I call it, is a virus Western society caught from the rationalist Kantian German tradition. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bourgeois sickness. Now, after reading enough political history, it becomes clear, in fact, that politics is the art of finding the least bad solutions, because every political act has a loser. There is nothing more to it than that. As Gomez Dowell said, every political solution limps, but some limp with elegance. The best organised political enterprises, just like the wisest economic measures, tend to boil down, in certain circumstances, to games of chance, where one might win by a stroke of luck when putting forward his policies. That's why every authentic reactionary is a natural-born monarchist and a believer in aristocratic forms of government. Every monarchy, of course, is fraught with problems, but it does satisfy the balance between ethics, aesthetics, and brute force better than any political system yet seen. But indeed, if there is one system that is absolutely intolerable to the reactionary, it is democracy in all forms. Democracy for us is not simply an elective form of appointing ministers and MPs. It's an entire heretical anthropotheist religion based on the doctrine that man is his own god. The kings of the past, bound by various forms of divine right, were, I believe, on the whole, less tyrannical and less bad than democratic leaders have been. This is because being of divine right held the monarch to absolute standards of behaviour and judgement and hierarchy. The representative of the people is bound by nothing more than his ability to win their votes. It is absolute in the worst sense. An authentic aristocrat, a ruler, makes it their duty to love the people. Democrats only love the people during election seasons. Now, I understand that this may seem odd uh, for the topic to bring up, because I imagine that many people think these sorts of things already, or other people reject them totally. But it's important because I see a serious error in our discourse. Many people here have educated themselves extraordinarily well in a number of great matters, politics, economics, power dynamics, etc. But too many classical texts, those that actually teach us, <coughs> that teach us what it is to be human and of this earth, have been neglected entirely. The authentic reactionary cannot simply be a peddler of theories and opinions, popular and unpopular. He needs a conception of the animal he and his fellows are, or else his judgments upon them will be inaccurate and fraught with error. This basically requires one to familiarise himself with the classical canon, the Greek tragedies most importantly, and I promise you this is not in any way a frivolous endeavour. This is vital stuff. The Greeks mastered human fallibility in their literature the way the Russians mastered sorrow and depression, or the English mastered satire. Either we learn from Greek tragedy how to read history, or we never learn to read history at all. The biggest indicator that our community is inauthentically reactionary is the way that we've talked about current events, and more importantly, current people. To be actually invested in that sort of thing to an unhealthy degree is expected of everybody else in the outside world. But in this community, to take an example, it was as if 2016, say, was the first time an unexpected candidate had ever entered the halls of power. Now, of course, many of us, that was the event that sent us down this path. After all, we aren't born reactionary in the womb. But to be an authentic reactionary is to have stepped back far enough from your own time that you see the entire tapestry, so to speak. A reader of de Tocqueville, for example, for example, would know of his prediction that democracy would become a conservative mechanism used by plebeians in protest against the ceaseless progressivism of the elites. The elites themselves are familiar with this principle, which is why they take action against it. Democracy is now a hindrance to the progressive machine when it was once its main engine. And I believe that the mass immigration of the last 50 years has been the realisation of what Brecht said about the anger of the East German Communist Party when it suffered at the polls. He remarked jokingly that the government should dissolve the people and elect a new one. Henceforth in the West there is no longer any hope in the polls for the reactionary because the people have been dissolved and a new one has been brought in. When the next unexpected event happens, the next time the modern world wobbles slightly on its foundations, it isn't enough for us to simply immerse ourselves in current phenomena as they happen we have to step back and look at the tapestry to, gain, uh, to gauge an accurate representation. For a serious mind, all the knowledge is there in Cicero and Homer and Plato. It's there in Montaigne and Dante and Ockham and De Maestro, very importantly. When you've really familiarised yourself with these types of authors, then contemporary events simply cease to matter 
beyond the vaguely interesting. What replaces them is a strong sense of the civilizational and a sense that this civilization is rapidly running out of time. Reality will come knocking on the door for it sooner or later. Now, there are certainly things in the news to look out for from a reactionary point of view. The eclipse of the world hegemon, the end of functional democracy, the collapse of the world economy, which I believe may shortly happen. But a slavish analysis of day-to-day occurrences in each country is, in my opinion, a waste of time. While great texts lie unread and ignored, much to our own detriment. Now, that pairs well with the idea around the network of tens. To use that saying of Aristotle's, we must strive for the habit of quality. Quality in all areas. Quality of thought, quality of taste, quality of manner. After all, I do believe civilizations are built on good manners. And quality of aesthetics. I do think that aesthetics is not quite yet given the gravity it deserves in circles such as these, though I'm greatly pleased with the number of speakers who chose aesthetic and artistic topics for this event. As I've said, an authentic reactionary is a believer in perennial absolute truth and wisdoms. As such, something understood by many in the pre-modern world was that certain vital ideas are communicated better in art than if they were communicated literally, point for point, academically. Aristotle said that Homer's epics taught Greek to the Hellenics, and by that he didn't mean the language, but rather that Homer was capable of enunciating the entire nexus of what it was to be a Greek at that time in its totality alongside telling of a rapidly good story. I've also heard it said that whenever asked what, in his opinion, the best book of poetry ever written was, Lord Dunsany replied, King James Bible. I think of the intellectual giants, or perhaps some of the intellectual giants, or not giants, depending on your view, of the last century, uh, take Sartre and Heidegger. Both were given to writing up their thoughts on what it was to be human, what it was to exist in vast tomes of academic theory and citation and complication. I don't think either of them came close to telling us more about the nature of man and his existence than Aristophanes or Milton did. Literature is not merely some psychological drug. It's a complex means of communication for saying very complex things. A melodramatic or cacophonous text, besides being ugly, is false. Poetry, on the other hand, rescues us from the chaos of the modern world by reconciling matter and spirit in a metaphor, personal metaphor. If the importance of art and letters in the war between tradition and modernity is not yet clear, one only needs to look around him to understand it. Perhaps the most serious charge against the modern world, as we've discussed so far, is the architecture. We know very well how to build industrial shacks and glassy temples to usury, but where are the palaces? Where are the cathedrals? What will this civilization leave behind except wastage and badly done statues to short autistic Swedish girls with a temper <laughs> and details in an agenda? Our art galleries are filled with generic works that signify basically nothing. We live in an age of total artistic sterility enforced by doctrines of money and professional academic idiocy. Now, the point about doctrines of money is an important one because it's a perfect illustration of the subverted hierarchy. The authentic reactionary is a man who understands the supreme value, hierarchy. Total and absolute hierarchy in all aspects. The place of the merchant in any given society varies, but in ours, they dominate all the other sections. I rather like the Japanese model of old, in which merchants were placed below peasants in the feudal hierarchy because they made nothing with their own hands. Now, perhaps that's a kind of extreme for Western society, but the fundamental point being made here is that things are out of their natural order to a gross degree. Gomez Davila, again, said that to go to the reactionary, the most offensive thing in the world is a disordered room. That is the attitude we must go forward with, not just in the Petersonian sense of room. Uh, In a society ordered according to such hierarchy, everybody fits into his place without the need to compare himself to the others, as occurs in the classically liberal model. The society in which all positions are potentially open to all subjects is one in which not only do the covetous and the power-hungry rise to the top, but one in which a great mass of people are treated cruelly. Because unlike the bourgeois liberals who formulated that doctrine, they are not power-hungry malcontents set on tearing down their lords and kings. Indeed, I believe Disraeli got it right in his judgment that provided they're well looked after, people have a natural affection and loyalty to aristocrats and monarchs. The lower and the upper must detest the rotten middle. Although I would urge you to be wary of Israeli's uh, political track record. Um, 
due to various uh, attributes we're not currently going to discuss. Um, now, when a society such as ours loses its ranks and classes, we descend into an amorphous mass of governed and governors, and not even the religious hierarchy is there anymore to save us. And I should point out, as a, a final point in favour of absolute hierarchy, and as a nod to my fellow Christians, hierarchy is the workings of heaven. The only place in which everybody is truly equal is hell. Now, one of the most infuriating aspects of modern life is the preoccupation with these things called rights. To the reactionary, there are no rights. There are only duties, responsibilities, and privileges. What we would call the rights of the Englishman of ages past to be treated in accordance with Magna Carta, for example, was really the duty and responsibility of the king and his ministers to treat him as such. That is a fact of human politics. All the governing powers of the modern world know this, even though they continue to pay lip service to ideas of universal human rights, broad liberalism, and free thought. We now live at the twilight of the post-war age. The current set of rulers feel less and less inclined to stick to the kind of benevolence they once pretended to have. There is no doubt that the screws are turning on us in every context. We stand against the creed of uniformity and consumerism and nihilism, the sexually, racially, and nationally androgynous bug man, as we term him. This does and will continue to draw flack from the rest of society, but the only action capable of surviving such pressure as it increases is the intelligence and erudition of the position of the authentic reactionary. When all our channels of communication are taken away, when we no longer have access to each other's content, to each other's ideas, we will only have the perennial values left to keep us on the right path, to navigate the storm without our compass. The education of ourselves in these ideas is not simply an aesthetic obligation to have a few nice chats. It's a necessary tool for the survival of tradition. One thing to put it best when you describe a collection of reactionary texts as a survival kit for an indefinite stay in the Arctic Circle. Now, I don't consider the position of the authentic reactionary to be of the right or of the left, but beyond them. As many of you know, the left-right dichotomy is a product of the revolutionary era, so to be right-wing in the traditional sense is to be in some way content with the progress of revolution. To sit on the benches of Congress or Parliament is to raise the standard of modernity. When I advocate the position of the authentic reactionary, I'm advocating for a position in which left and right are merely terms used by subversives to describe each other. Now, I'm advocating for a position that lives within the world created before left and right are conceivable concepts. And although I admire many of the authors I'm about to name, I would, would urge everyone to read them, the authentic reactionary is not a gentlemanly English conservative, even if he outwardly appears to be one. He isn't in the liberal tradition of Scruton and Oakeshott and Burke. If he's comparable to any relatively recent figure, I suppose he's something of a Ruskin-esque type, uh, a violent Tory in the older sense of the term, uh, the sort of Queensbury type that sees a socialist and beats him with his cane. You know. uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't invite him into the House of Commons to speak to them. Um, and yet, that same kind of uh, uh, tweedy brute, I suppose, has a, a sensitive mind to the great intellectual and aesthetic questions of his day. Now, to actually just to say step into a mindset may sound relatively straightforward and almost inadequate, but when you push yourself to reach such a place intellectually, it's quite a shock to the brain. Now, the great characters of tradition, which is to say most of history's notable figures, maintain a set of metaphysical truths about the world that manifest as wisdoms. This is the part I'm getting into where we go from here. Um, the average family unit, for example, before the advent of the modern world, was largely uniform as was a traditional kingdom. But more so than that, there is a deep divide between the man of tradition and the man of modernity, because the former has a constant spirituality and the latter does not. And what is this spirituality? Well, it has everything to do with the aforementioned orthodoxy. Now, I dislike using current events and speeches like this because it tends to date them rather poorly, but this strikes me as the best way to illustrate the point at hand. Think of what we've seen in Afghanistan these past few weeks. The withdrawal of the global liberal regime from the country. Now, before I go any further, I'm not here to sing the praises of the Taliban um, or say that uh, we should advocate for or against anything that they stand for. The point of bringing them up is that they represent something 
of a current in Afghan history of spine, an iron spine, if you like, that has thrown up empire after empire after empire for millennia. The Indian Maharajas couldn't conquer Afghanistan. The Persians couldn't. Uh, the, Russians, <laughs> the Russians, both Tsarists and Soviet, couldn't do it. The British, for all their trying, certainly couldn't do it. And now it's been revealed that the American, uh, I should have called them the POS machine, can't do it. Some will tell you it's simply a matter of geographical difficulty, but this is in fact false. There are far more inhospitable lands and peoples that have been conquered and ruled with ease. The Afghans are a set of people and tribes that have maintained their relative sovereignty because when they're up against it, they share certain vital things. They share that metaphysical creed. They share a vision of Afghanistan as an Islamic country, governed by tradition, as important in traditionalist rulers, and in traditional ways of everyday life. They tolerate no diversion from this creed, which is why they fight invaders. And yet, within that creed exist innumerable ethnic, philosophical, cultural, religious, and mundane differences. This is my definition of orthodoxy, the thriving locality within the traditional metaphysical identity of the whole. Take a look at Spain. In the last hundred years, Franco and his nationalists rose up and overthrew the leftist government. It didn't matter if you were a monarchist, a fascist, a conservative, a republican, a lord, a farmer, or a workman. It didn't even matter if you liked Franco. All that mattered was that Spain was Catholic, culturally Spanish, and free from foreign government. It's the same force that let them spend 700 years driving out the Moors. The point here is that to maintain tradition, the metaphysical orthodoxy and the will to win is what carries you through. It's ultimately what I'm trying to illustrate with this speech. And when this uh, horrendous civilization that we now live in finally begins to crumble, perhaps it will be 700 years, there's got to be a group of people like us ready to keep the torch lit, so to speak, to see that these ideas and the will to fight is carried on and on and on. When the tiger is ready to collapse, we will be ready. Because unlike the Afghans, unlike the medieval Spanish, there is difficulty for us. We have lost our creed, we in the West. We've got to reforge a new creed, but the material for it is all there. It's there in the texts of Greece and Rome, it's there in the Bible. It's there in every syllable of Western history, but we won't keep that alive if we fail to understand it. Now, to step back from the historical grandstanding, it's clear that our options are very limited. I'm not proposing here that we don turbans and AKs and take up arms with refugee beacons. The point is, the war has to be fought metaphysically, and this room of people will pose no opposition whatsoever to the modern world unless we too adopt a unified metaphysical creed that unifies our disparate elements without erasing them. We can remain intellectual, we can remain civilised, but we must be imbued with a certain spirit of God, and our traditions and our roots be firmly bedded in that creed. And what should this creed be? Now, I know there are a decent number of people here who are not meaningfully religious. Very few things to be outright, outright atheists, uh, I've come with the word, sorry God. Um, but for all intents and purposes, uh, there are a decent number of such people. Now, this lack of religiosity is clear in the way such people think and talk and act. They lack that decisive metaphysical bite, that will in their words and deeds. There isn't really an easy way to say this, but it is absolutely fraudulent that this community term itself reactionary or anti-modern until the belief in a god and the immortality of the human soul are established beyond doubt. I believe intellectuals should doubt everything except the existence God. There must be an absolute belief that certain forms of language, certain forms of spiritual culture, exist outside of man. Law and morality must be based in an absolute eternal truth. Remember, even now, in this day and age, it still says Dieu et mon roi above the judge's bench in every courtroom of this country, because it used to be that law flowed from the monarch and therefore from God. Beyond everything else, that's what capital P tradition is founded on. If you're uncomfortable in returning to the pre-modern mindset, then really you're a part of the modern world, when you ought to be a rogue element in it. The authentic reactionary is, after all, the arch enemy of Gnosticism, that ever-present fallacy that each human contains an element of the divine, that humanity is capable of being raised to the level of God. 
This is the heresy that is still the modern age and the authentic Christian faith, I believe, is the only thing to it. Now, I don't have time to preach any one faith today, but in my personal opinion, the only true way for the reactionary European is the pre Vatican II Catholic Orthodoxy. Now, in that creed, all the rivers of our past flow into one sea the pagan, the Roman, the Greek, the mystic, the scholarly, the humanistic, and the orthodox. Before the recent break with Latin tradition, the faith of the authentic reactionary was obviously the Roman Church. And since that break, a speech like this has made many, many times harder, because I'm sure, as you will know, the Catholic Church is not the organ of tradition it once was. So I'm not here to ask anybody to convert. But I do maintain that the authentic reactionary, the person interested in saving the West or reconstructing the West and wishing to remain fundamentally Western, must keep something of a Catholic position. Catholic tastes, Catholic metaphysics, aesthetics, and morality. Now, other areas of Christianity, I think, lack the influence of, say, Greece and Rome. They've lost their medieval inheritance, their patristic element. They have no orthodoxy. That's how you end up in a country like America with a million different sects and 10,000 parts of gym bobs with a Bible they read in one hand and a transgender flag in the other. <laughs> now, most vitally, the authentic, traditionally Catholic reactionary has the metaphysics of his church around him like scaffolding, like a cradle. Each text he reads, each work of art he sees, every ideology he considers are worked through that doctrine in a nuanced way. It's the foundation for a higher purpose. We cannot continue to do as we have been doing, clicking from idea to idea and author to author every week and adopting a faint outline of their metaphysics. A proper creed has got to be founded and stuck to if we're going to get anywhere. Even beyond the spirituality of the West, I urge the authentic reactionary to study deeply all the anti-modern doctrines and texts he can get his hands on. In particular, the Hindu faith, the martial Sikhs, the great Arab scholars, the Eastern monks and poets. Readers of Elva and Guénon here will already no doubt be aware of this. To put it bluntly, the anti-modern world is more than just the free liberal West, and before another modern book of economic or political theory is drawn through, I urge you to seek yourselves in the unwavering faith of the perennial world. I promise you the best passages of Rumi or the Sutras will take you into realms you did not think existed. In times such as these, it is necessary to look outside the West, perhaps, in order to save it. Now, the authentic reactionary, when his scepticism permits him, dreams of an ideal society, an ideal Europe, if you want the OG Trumpton. <laughs> this is a society that existed in the peaceful intervals of old, between the reign of Constantine and the death of Dante, as I dated, Alta Europa. All over the pre modern world, such places existed in happy abundance. It is, I believe, the manner in which men are meant to live, and on the societal level, what we ought to be looking for to resurrect. The demographic, industrial, ethnic, and democratic forces have extinguished that way of life. But a room of people like this, with a unified metaphysical creed, can very well bring about its return. And I can think of nothing better to leave you with today than that. Thank you very much.